If you can lead with that and have that the main thing that they see, hey, here's how much you spent, here's how many leads and results that you got, and here's how much money you actually generated, you can separate yourself massively from the pack. You can make it so that the client should never question the, the investment they're making in your service, um, and you can really maximize your retention rates. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the High Level Spotlight Sessions, where we showcase awesome marketers doing awesome marketing. Today, I'm joined once again by Josh Nelson. He is the founder of Seven Figure Agency, and they have helped uh, coach, mentor, guide so many of the high level community members um, to a higher level of success. So, Josh, thank you so much for coming back to chat with us today. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. It's an honor to, to be able to share here. Josh, um, Man, we hear nothing but great things about your group, about the Seven Figure Agency. So I'm really excited when you sent me the topic um, for our talk today about retention. And retention is one of the, you know, the core goals of High Level is to help agencies and consultants retain clients longer through a system, through code, right? Through automations and platforms. But I have a feeling you're going to talk not just about uh, tech, but some other strategies as well to keep clients around, which is really the name of the game. 100%. You know, one of the biggest challenges I think in, in running an agency is you get the clients, you pour yourself into it and they cancel. And I remember, I guess, I don't know how long ago, it was maybe two, three years ago where I was meeting with Sean and he was like, this is the big challenge we need to use high level to solve for and help agencies kind of bridge the gap between the results that they're getting um, and the services that they're charging to make it a no-brainer for the client to continue to pay their monthly retainer fees. Mm -hmm. And I mean, briefly, let's, I mean, we, we talk a lot about this, but I do think we should touch on it. Um, the importance of retention, right? Like, tell me about if you're not retaining clients, which many of you can probably relate to this if you're early in your agency journey, it feels like a roller coaster, right? You get five new clients, you're super excited, but then next month starts and shoot, I just lost three of the clients I got two months ago. So now I need to do something about that. Talk to me about the trap that that causes, the cycle. Well, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of challenges that come up if you can't retain, right? First of all, just the energy waste of like getting excited, doing the work, hustling, and then losing the client, losing that recurrence of revenue. Um, but I think it also really can ne negatively impact your reputation, especially if you're a niche focused agency, right? If you start to lose clients, people start to be like, well, what's going on? Maybe they're not delivering on their promises. Maybe they can't actually do what they say. Um, but also just from your own personal ability to go out and continue to sell because of your confidence, you know, you lose two, three clients, all of a sudden you don't have that head of steam that you had to go out and introduce your services and try and get new clients. So I've seen it can completely deflate uh, what would have otherwise been a very successful agency. And how about, you know, you're an agency owner, you've had an agency for a very long time. Talk to me about the problems it causes as far as forecasting being able to forecast your team? How can you know what you're going to be able to afford to hire uh, when you're stuck in a churn cycle? Yeah. If you don't have consistency with retention and you can't forecast like, okay, we're going to retain at least 96% month over month. Um, it's hard to tell who you can hire, what you can invest in advertising, um, what you can pay yourself as the owner of the business with confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of feel like you're, you're in a bit of quicksand with your, with your business, right? It's like, you don't really know what's solid and what's just going to go by the wayside over the next six to 12 months. Hmm. All right. So let's talk about it. how do we fix it? How do you help folks retain clients uh, for, you know, hopefully years? Yeah, I'd love to dive into it. I've got a whole, a whole deck here that I can kind of go deep on this. This is something we usually share with our members, but since we, we have so many people in high level that are part of, you know, the seven figure agency, I just wanted to unpack this because I think it can have a huge impact on all high level users ability to retain their users, retain their client base um, and be a lot more sticky long-term. Let's do it. Awesome. So here's, here's what I wanna cover on today's session. Um, I wanna talk about the number one reason clients leave and how to address it, right? A lot of people think that it's one thing but it's actually something completely different. Um, we'll talk about the retention model, um, how to craft onboarding experience so that you kick things off on the right foot. I've really found that how you kick things off can set the pace for whether the client stays with you a year or two years down the track. Really, really important that you get that dialed in. Um, we're going to talk about the reporting and communication flow that you should be using on a monthly basis. 
um, and how to track client retention rates. Right? You can't improve what you don't measure. And I'm always amazed when I talk with agencies and I'm like, well, what's your retention rate? And they're like, I don't know, right? How could you possibly improve that? How could you know if it's good, bad, or indifferent if yeah. you don't? Um, and then I'm going to share what some solid retention targets are and kind of what you should be shooting for from a retention perspective. Like, no, okay, 100% is, is a fool's errand, right? That's not going to happen. Um, and kind of give you some good benchmarks to work from. Chase, does that sound Perfect. good? Is that kind of in line with what we want to cover on today's session? No, that's fantastic. And I love the, the part about retention and knowing what your rate is. You know, we did our own research across the board, across high level agencies. And, you know, we found that the churn rate is really high and that's a problem, right? And so if you don't know where you're at in comparison to that, you might not know how bad things really are. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that section. 100%. If you're watching this in the replay afterwards here, um, just give me a, a yes or something just to, to know that we're on the right track, wherever you happen to be watching this. So Chase and I talked a little bit about the, the problem and kind of the, the reason we should even think about retention. I'll kind of breeze through this real quick. But the fact is clients cancel, right? It's, it's just fact and reality. You, I, we all get the message every now and then, hey, I'm sorry, we're going to need to go another direction. Uh, or sometimes how it goes is they're just going to say, hey, I need to pause things for a little bit. I need to slow things down. Um, and that, that's frustrating, right? It can really destroy your confidence and kill your energy to sell, which is mission critical to continue to grow and scale your agency. Um, and the fact is, if you can't retain, you won't move forward, right? You'll be like this guy on the treadmill. You'll take one step forward and then one step back, and it feels like quick stand, and it just, it's no fun that way. And if we can't retain and we're in a vertical, you know, our agency works with plumbing and HVAC contractors. Um, and we've found that being in a niche is kind of the fastest, most efficient way to grow your agency. Um, that's great. The good news, you know, the good news spreads fast. Uh, but by the same contrast, if you're in a small niche and you don't, don't deliver the goods and you can't retain the clients, that negative feedback is also going to spread very quickly. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't talk about that enough, but that's very true. Yeah. And so ultimately, you're going to lose your confidence, your ability to grow efficiently if you don't solve for this. And so, you know, Chase, I'd love to hear, like, as you think about the members of high level, like, what are the what are they finding the hardest part of retaining clients is, do you think? I mean, I feel like a lot, especially those that are early on in their agency journey, don't know yet. Like they haven't figured out what it is, but it's usually a combination of um, not onboarding well, not having a good system to kick things off on the right uh, path, yep. misaligned expectations. Yes. Um, I feel like honestly, most people do a good job of performing. You know, we know how to generate leads, but we might be letting, and this is where high level can really help is we might not be taking some of the closing out of their hands with automated nurture and things like that. And then um, probably just the relationship management, right? So I'm, I'm glad to see you're going to talk about what, you know, you talk about or advise as far as monthly reporting, what that should look like, how much should they get every month, um, things like that. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like those are the common challenges we hear with retention day in and day out. Um, really the, what, what, what I want to solve for today, really what I want to arm you guys with as you're watching this, this spotlight session is we want clients to come on board be happy and stick around long term, right? That's the objective. And really to do that well, we want to kick things off on a really solid footing. Like where they, they've signed up with you and you just do such a great job with the execution and you kind of surprise and delight them a couple of times in the beginning that they're, they're like super impressed. Ultimately, we keep them on board and we have really what gives us the ability to succeed, to, to grow and, and to scale. And so... A really, really interesting study was done by Bain. And what they found was that a 5% increase in customer retention can improve your profits by 25 to 95%. And so digital marketers, digital agency owners were usually very focused on growth, myself included. Like we want to land more clients. We want to grow the top line. We're very focused on that side of the equation. But the reality is just a marginal improvement in how well you retain and how many of your clients stay with you that extra five, six, 12 months can have a huge impact on profitability. I love that. This is something Sean's so good at. You know, we come up with this huge plan and he's like, but show me the incremental step, the, the baby step that we're going to take first, because baby steps have huge impact. 
And oftentimes you can get overwhelmed by trying to do the whole thing at once when really a baby step was what you needed. 100%. So this is important, right? Focus on retention. It will make you more money. It will make you more profitability. I want to start with some basic fundamentals. Like in my mind, the key tenets of, of long-term client retention, um, and then we'll get into very, very detailed stuff. The first in my mind is to focus on impact, right? Which means ensure that the services you provide actually drive a tangible, measurable return on investment. Uh, I think a lot of agencies get stuck in this trap where it's like, okay, what's the cool, sexy thing I can sell in digital marketing? Is it SEO? Is it pay-per-click? Is it funnels? Is it marketing automation? Is it posting the social profiles on a daily basis? Is it sending email broadcasts? Well, if you can get to the bottom line here, which is to focus on impact, actually deliver services that generate a return on investment, that's going to make you stickier, right? People are only going to pay so long for an activity-based service, whatever activity that is. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if you can frame your service offering in terms of they're going to spend a dollar and get three to five times or more in return, you've got the foundation for a good service that's actually going to retain clients for the long term. The second is, I really think you, you typically need to go wider. If you can go wider with your service offering, you can become a lot more sticky, right? If you're just doing Facebook ads or you're just doing email automation or you're just selling software as a service, you basically have one foot in the door where if you come in and you're focused on impact and you provide a more comprehensive solution that's going to actually get them what they want, which is more leads, more sales and revenue growth, they're going to have more reasons to stick with you because you've got control of their website potentially. You're doing SEO, you're driving database reactivation and email marketing, and you're kind of taking a holistic approach. Obviously, that is going to improve retention. Does that make sense, Chase? A ton of sense. And I think what a lot of folks who are just starting out who are just doing one thing don't realize is the one, it's so easy to leverage one thing into another. Like if you're running ads, you're building a database, you mentioned database reactivation, it's just a natural extension. So you'd be foolish to not add that as an additional service that you offer. Yeah, so keep it simple, right? You don't like, sometimes you look at all these services, you get, you think, oh man, this is too complicated, no way I can manage, I'll keep it simple. But if you continue to focus on impact, you're not just adding additional services for the sake of retention, you're adding additional services because you can control the outcome that the client gets. Obviously, that's going to make you stickier. I, I, I've found, like, as I've kind of researched agencies that have high churn rates, right? And it just it feels like they're constantly losing clients. Oftentimes, it's client selection more than anything else. They're, they've got a great service offering. They provide mm -hmm. great service and results for their clients, but they still lose clients month in and month out. And they're just like, what's the problem? Really, the clients that you choose to work with in your agency can make or break retention, right? And that, in my mind, is are you choosing to work with the startup, the one-man operation, like the, the smaller company that really doesn't have their business fully fleshed out uh, versus working with the more established companies that are already successful and are just looking to accelerate things to the next level? In our agency, we work with plumbing companies. When we were working with the one-man operation, our churn rate was through the roof, just constant cancellations. And we did the same good services. When we decided to change our focus to plumbing and HVAC companies greater than a million dollars per year, the game changed because those companies were better established. They had the right systems in place and they could, they could manage to pay our fee and get a good return on investment from the services. What are your thoughts on this one, Chase? That's really interesting. I'd really, I'm assuming you talk much more in depth about this in your group, but it's fascinating to me. I'd love to hear about how you teach people to have those conversations. Like you're not just going to, Oh, sorry. We only work with plumbers that make more than a million bucks. Like, why is that? I'd be really curious to learn more. And maybe we should book another talk about the psychology of that and whatnot. But I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of saying no, of turning down a client that's ready to write the check but in the grand scheme of things, it could really be a, a bad decision to say yes. Yeah, I could definitely go deeper on that. I have a lot to cover here in, in terms of retention. Suffice it to say, focusing on the higher end of the market, most of the time is going to be where you can build the longest foundation, right? The, the longest base with your, your clients. And then, you know, setting expectations, Chase mentioned this earlier, can have a huge impact on retention as well. If you come into the relationship and frame it like, hey, look, let's do a test. 
Let's see how things go in the first 30 days. And then we'll see where we are after that. In the, in the client's mind, even if they've signed up, they're thinking, I give this like two weeks. And if it's not crushing it for me, I'm out. Versus this is going to be a long-term business relationship. This is what we're going to do. This is the results you can expect. But if we're not going to commit to do this together for the next 12 months, let's not bother. I hope it's clear that while this might be easier to sell in the, in the front end, this, I'm not saying go out and sell 12 month agreements, but if you frame it in that way, obviously they're going to be in for the long term and much more likely to stick around until things really pick up. I wonder so if you have any thoughts on. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not saying, Hey, go create some ironclad 12 month contract. You're saying frame it up, speak in a language of, Hey, this is a relationship this is what's going to happen over the first three months. This is what's going to happen within the first six months. This is what's going to happen by the end of the year, et cetera. Yes, 100%. I'm not, and some people get hung up on this, like, oh, 12 months. I don't want to do a 12-month contract. I want to prove my value month after month. That's fine, right? Mm -hmm. But set the expectation that as long as we're doing good work together, this is going to be a year, multi-year relationship, not a short-term, let's see how things work out. Yeah, yeah. Got it. So just some quick fundamentals on that. You know, the, you know I think that, if you build on, on this foundation, you're going, everything else we, I'm going to share with you is going to work even better. Um, you know, just, just some basic fundamentals. And if you're watching this either in the Facebook group or on YouTube, post a comment like, what, which of these do you think you need to put in place? Which of these do you think can have the biggest impact just foundationally on your, on your retention? So the next, the next thing I want to talk about here just for a sec, the number one reason clients leave, and I love, you know, just kind of, Put a guess in the, in the comments if you're watching this. Um, what do you think the number one reason clients leave this? You know, we're thinking about digital marketing agency services, software as a service. Number one reason clients leave. I can't wait to read these comments, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, usually what I hear is results, right? We didn't get enough results. Or I hear um, in a bad client. Or I hear failed execution. Or I hear um, any variety of things. No ROI. Mm -hmm. What we found is the number one actual reason that a client leaves is perceived indifference, especially in, in your digital marketing agency retainer-based services. Wow. They leave because they feel like you and your company don't really care that much anymore. They kind of feel like you've disengaged. They're just a number on a shelf somewhere. And, and so it's not that hard to solve for perceived indifference, right? Totally. Show the clients that you care pay attention to them, send monthly reports, kind of check in with them on a consistent basis. And you can take this number one reason off the table. Is that what you were going to say, Chase? Is that what you were thinking? No, <laughs> it wasn't, to be honest. I was thinking uh, misalignment of expectations. Yeah, and, and that obviously plays a role. Uh, but if sure. you just look at it, the reality, like especially the, you know, the six, 12, 24 month period, it's, it's perceived indifference is the number one reason they leave. And the flip and so side of that, I can testify to be true. We had clients, we would retain clients whose campaigns were not performing for mm -hmm. months and months because they just loved the relationship. They believed that we were improving things, even though things weren't hitting goals yet, but they felt the love. <laughs> so they yeah. hung around. Yeah. hundred percent. I think that's exactly where I'm headed next is that it is a healthy balance, right? If they, the number one reason they're going to leave is perceived indifference. Like results are important, right? You have to get the results eventually. Otherwise they're going to, they're going to leave, but there also is that relationship, right? And if either of these are out of balance, you're going to have a good chance that the clients are going to leave, right? You can be crushing it for the client, getting tons of leads, tons of sales, great results. But if they're getting no relationship from you, they don't feel like you care, you're not checking in, you're not showing the value, you're not you know, presenting a great experience, eventually the balance is going to tip out of favor for you and the client's going to, going to leave. Now on the same token, like, like Chase just said there, let's say you've got great relationship. They love you. They, they feel like you're the best person they've ever dealt with and they believe that you can deliver the goods. But at the end of the day, the results aren't there over time, they're going to wind up canceling anyways, right? So you For really sure. need to have a healthy balance between relationship and, and results. And so you really want to think about that in terms of how you present your service offering and kind of how you 
how you go to market. Chase, is this like a good, like high level, like explanation of kind of the key things you want to think about from a retention perspective? Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. So let's get into it. I'm going to unpack this model. I've got a lot of ground to cover, but I want to make sure we get through this relatively quickly. So the, the model that I found that works best from a client retention perspective, there's really key, three key things we want to focus on. Onboarding, right? We talked about the fact that if we can kick things off well out of the gates, it's going to massively improve the, the chance that they're with us three months down the road, six months down the road, or 12 months down the road. So getting world-class onboarding dialed in, really important. Effective communication, which is how do we communicate with that client out of the gates and then on a monthly basis? What are the reports we're going through? How are we communicating? How are we pulsing to help them understand the value that we bring to the table and, and the reason that they're with us in the first place? And then as you grow and as your agency goes from 10 to 15 clients to 100 plus clients, you really have to have a strategy and a system for success management, right? How do we go and still have that relationship when there's hundreds of clients, right? How do we show that we care and avoid perceived indifference? Um, and so I really think you want to dial in these three things, right? Your onboarding, your, your monthly communication and pulsing, and then your success management. And I'll, I'm going to unpack these on today's session as we go. But the first is we want to kick off with a bang and appreciation, right? So kick off with the bang is we're going to send them something in the mail. We're going to show them that we're happy that they signed up with us. But then we're also going to make sure we've dialed in that onboarding experience. Really, really important. We want to seamlessly collect the data. And depending upon how complex your service offering is, I, I, I think you want to do more things. If you've got a complex onboarding process and you've got a lot of usernames and passwords you need to get, you've got pictures you need to get, you've got you know, USP data that you need to get for messaging, you want to try and make that as simple as possible and take as much off of the client's plate as you possibly can and it's really important, I think what a lot of people miss is that we want to engineer quick wins. Like you can strategically decide, here's two or three things we can do month one that will generate some leads or will generate some revenue that will get them excited about the fact that they've made this buying decision. Um, so that onboarding process, if you get these three things dialed in, will have a huge impact in that first 60 to 90 days. Any thoughts on this port, Chase, in terms of Onboarding. I love the third piece because I feel like that's where high level can really kick it into gear for you because, oh, yeah. you know, you put the web chat widget on, you turn on GMB chat, these simple things can generate really quick wins that can really help the onboarding go well because they're like, whoa, I haven't even, like you said, I haven't even filled out all the forms yet. I haven't sent you the photos yet, but yet conversations are happening already. This is really, I'm really excited about where this is going to go. 100%. And you know those quick wins and you can, you can, it instantaneously impress the client and a, a couple impresses early will actually go a lot further than you think. Absolutely. So on, a, on a monthly basis, in terms of the effective communication, what we want to do is we want to dial in strategic reporting and KPIs. So I'm going to talk about the specific types of reports that we found work best. Um, and it's this, it's the specific things they want to see. It's not necessarily drowning them in data. Here's all the analytics. Here's all the ranking reports. Here's all the call data, like strategically finding the things that they need to see to determine, all right, is this moving in the right direction? Am I with the right company? And are things moving in a positive direction? From there, we want to, we want to figure out what our meeting rhythm is. How often should we be meeting with the client? What should we cover on those meetings? What do we do when they don't show up, right? How do we, how do we make sure that we're if we're getting a retainer fee of $1,000 to $2,000 a month or more, how, do we, how, how often do we pulse to keep that relationship active? And what does that look like? Um, and then we have to make sure that we're seeding the vision, right? The number one reason a client leaves is perceived indifference. Second to that, it's that they feel like you've taken them as far as you can go, right? Whatever it was that you were going to do, whether it was the website, SEO, pay-per-click, database reactivation, setting up high level and, and funnels and all this stuff, they feel like all right, you've done your thing and there's no innovation happening. There's so much competitive com competition in this space that if you're not constantly saying, hey, here's what we've done and here's where we're headed over the next three to six months, they're going to start to look at the grass across the, the way that's a little bit greener. Any, any thoughts on communication, Chase, that you want to add? I mean, this is the part where if you're a young agency entrepreneur, 
I feel like hooking up with folks like Josh is so critical because this piece is so nuanced, but you have to figure it out. Because like he just said, if you, if you aren't constantly coming back and saying, hey, here's the stuff we, I told you we were going to talk about 30, 60 days ago. Now let's talk about the stuff we're going to talk about in 30 and 60 days. Like if you're not continually recapping and mapping exactly what he just said is going to happen, they're going to start to wonder, hey, why haven't we heard from them? Hey, what happened to the plan that they outlined? Have we gotten any updates on that plan? And that's when things go south really quickly. 100%, 100%. That effective communication can make all of the difference in the world. Sometimes it's easy to sell it and then it's easy to onboard it and like create that excitement, but it's hard to continue to carry the relationship forward. Um, and then the third pillar is success management, right? We talked about you have to measure what you want to improve. So we have to be tracking our client churn rates. We have to know month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year, how are we doing? How many clients are we gaining? How many are we losing? What's our retention rate? What's our our churn rate. We really have to know that number. Um, we should have some strategic KPIs, key performance indicators that we're looking at from our account management team. Like as you grow, as you scale, as you stop being the one selling the client, retaining the client, managing the relationship, you know, how do you train an account manager to step in, to take the ball and run with it on your behalf and keep a pulse on them and the fact that they're doing right by your clients to really maximize the retention rates. And I really like the idea of having a traffic like system, right? I don't know how many of you guys, and I know a lot of you in high level have hundreds and hundreds of, of users. You know, when you've got hundreds of clients, it can be hard to see who's happy, who's sad, who's about to run out the door. And we found is if you can drop your clients on a pipeline and just say, all right, here's my greens. These are our clients that are checking in for the monthly meetings that are happy with the results. Here's our clients that are yellow, which means they're not showing up or something's not quite right. Um, you know, those are yellow and the reds, like they're just getting no results. They've just threatened to cancel and, and put them in a pipeline in that way where you can visually from a snapshot view, see exactly where your clients sit. Then you can manage to that. You can say, okay, let's place an emphasis on our, our green, our, our reds and our yellows and see what can be done. Do we need to check in with them? Do we need to send a gift? Do we need to change something in their campaign? Do we need to run a database reactivation to move them back to green? That per perpetual management of your, of your client base is what's gonna help you retain over the, over the long term. So just a high level model here, we're gonna get very specific in all of this stuff in a couple of minutes. Any thoughts that stand out to you, uh, Chase, on this before we press forward? I love the traffic light analogy. We used to call those the red light, green light calls. And that's where account management would sit down with um, operations lead and CEO to go over the reds, the greens, the yellows, and CEO would spend a lot of time, you know, assisting with the reds. And I feel like that's a great task for CEOs to be worried about, but he needs that information, he or she, I should say, from the account managers so that, you know, they know where they need to go spend a little extra love or go help a team member to get a, a red or a yellow back to a green. Yeah, 100%. Great practice. It's funny when I see agencies, a lot of times they just, you know, they've landed clients over the years and they're doing the best they can to retain. And as they get past 30, 60, 100 clients, they don't really have a snapshot view. They kind of lose a pulse on what's going on and putting a simple mechanism like that in place and having a, a meeting ritual where the team meets to, to, to kind of raise those reds and yellows. You can really help give visibility and with visibility, improve, really improve the problems, right? Solve the issues and keep those clients happy. Yeah, no, it's super important to know yellows and reds. For sure. hundred <laughs> percent. So I put together a workbook here. Um, Chase, I don't know if we can send this as a, as a link. Um, it's sevenfigureagencycom slash retention dash workbook. Maybe we can include this as just one yeah, of yeah. The, the links. Of course. Um, and it just, it will help you track along with everything we're covering uh, on today's session. So as, I, as I'm going through this, I'd like you to think about what part of your retention strategy needs the most work? Is it the onboarding potentially? Like, are you really creating world-class experience out of the gates? Um, is it the monthly rituals? Like, are you truly checking in with your clients on a monthly basis and have a proactive approach to show the love and to show kind of where you're headed and what you're doing? Um, or maybe potentially is it you've grown and you don't have a great client management strategy in place where you have account managers and you can keep a pulse on that level of activity? 
Uh, so just like we're going to cover a lot of ground, just be clear in your mind, where do you think you need the most attention so that as we go through this, you can go in and apply the resources that will move the needle. How are we doing so far, Chase? Are you comfortable with what we've covered? Is this solid? No, this is great. Let's awesome. dive in. So let, let's dive in. What we're going to talk about now, really, I'm going to break this into those three components. I'm going to talk about the onboarding process and how to create a world-class onboarding experience. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the client communication rhythm and the reporting. Um, and then we're going to talk about client success management. We're going to break it into those three key sections. So as it, as it, as it relates to world-class onboarding, the first thing we want to do is, is welcome with the bang and appreciation. And it's a little thing that can make a massive difference in the experience that your client has. So while yes, you can use automation to send a, hey, welcome aboard, fill out your form. And I think a lot of us do that, but very rarely do we create an experience outside the norm. Um, and so what we'd like to do is actually put a physical welcome basket into the mail. Hey, welcome aboard, so excited to have you. Um, and it's just kind of a, an unusual gift basket that they are like, wow, that's different. Not, most agencies aren't doing that. I appreciate that. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, we drop another box in the mail that has some tchotchkes and some stuff about us and our agency. A double gift bag. I love it. Okay. 100%, 100%. So show the love, show the appreciation. Just dropping a $75 gift basket into the mail, having it part of your automatic onboarding process will be a massive game changer and separator between you and, and the competition of the people maybe that they've used in the past. We really want to welcome with a bang and appreciation. Can I jump in with a quick question there? Is yeah, there a absolutely. service that you guys like to do that automated fulfillment of gifting? Yeah, actually, I've got links to all of that. So we use a service um, for, we use um, Gourmet Gift Baskets, which is a, like a cost-effective basket service. Um, and then we've got a custom box that we've put together that we send down to a company called City Blueprint in Wichita, Kansas. Um, there's other services that will do that. Um, I think you guys use Swag Up. Is that right? Uh, Printful, Swag Up. Yeah, we've used a bunch of different options for different scenarios. Yep. So you can create a really nice experience when the, the order gets processed, it triggers it, they get something in the mail and it, it just is, is unusual and highly appreciated by whoever received something physical outside of just digital emails and Facebook messages and, and things like that. Yep. And it's just a web hook and an automation. 100%. Yep. yep. <laughs> So the, the next thing is we want to make sure that we get the details in a seamless and professional manner, right? There's lots of ways to go wrong with this. Um, you know, I, I'm going to show some examples here with how we do this in high level, but um, what you don't want to do is drop a, you know, 172 question survey on them and go radio silent until they fill it in, right? You want to try and break it down into component parts and do some of the heavy lifting, right? Some of your clients are paying you because they don't know how to do this stuff. They don't know what their usernames and passwords are. They don't know how to get into that Facebook account. And so you want to jump on a meeting and have a, a kind of a structured process to extract the key details um, as opposed to just leaving it into a web form for them. You want to get intentional about mapping out the first week, the first 30 days, and the first 90 days. Like there's a great book by Michael e. Gerger Erber called The E-Myth Revisit, which I think most of you have either read or listened to. It's one of those foundational business books. Um, and he used as an analogy in the e-myth around a hotel operator that just, they, they created an amazing experience. Like when you walk in, the person knows your name. And then when you get to the room, they've got the, the light like dim to a certain level. And when you go out to you know, swim in the pool, you come back and they've got your pillow already set with a little mint on it. Um, and it, it's just a matter of the owner of that hotel thinking what that experience would need to look like and what would have to happen behind the scenes with the staff to create that experience. And what I want to encourage you to do is to really intentionally develop an experience for your clients. So when they sign up, really think about what the touch points are, what they receive in the email, what they receive in the mail, and not just the details, but the experience that you create. And that can really make a difference in your outcomes. We want to engineer the quick wins, right? And I'm sure Chase is going to have some really cool ideas to add to this, but really not just here's our standard practice, right? We're going to set up the website and we're going to write the content and we're going to claim the directories and all of this stuff's going to happen, but really intentionally thinking, what can we do in the first week, in the first couple of weeks 
to create not just activity, but actual tangible results. And then we want to make sure we're communicating every step of the way, right? Oftentimes, I know we, we were guilty of this for a long time in our agency, we do a lot of stuff, right? Maybe it takes us two weeks to design a beautiful website comp that they can see. And then it takes us, you know, a couple of weeks to get all of the content written and start to get some, you know, work happening from an SEO perspective. And we're hustling, right? We're doing work behind the scenes, us and our contractors and our team, but the client feels like you went radio silent on them. I know like this was what's happening to us at Plumbing and HVAC SEO. We yeah. would just get to work and the client would, you know, check in a month later, two months later and be like, hey, we're, we're about to cancel. I'm like, what? what are you talking about? We did like hundreds of hours of work because yeah. we're excited about this. Um, and the miss is like middle school though. You have to show your work along the way or you don't get full credit. 100% <laughs> communicate, let them know, use automations, let them know all of the little minuscule tasks that you create that you accomplished. And instead of them feeling like you went radio silent, they'll feel like, man, these guys are over communicating. These guys are on top of the ball. These guys are amazing. And you're going to do the same amount of work, but the clients are going to be so much happier. Anything else you wanted to add on this particular topic, Chase? No, I think it's a challenge. I mean, again, I'm sure you guys go deeper into this in your group, um, but it's a challenge to figure out how to do that without having it become a massive burden uh, as far as you know, time and energy. But I do think it's absolutely critical you mentioned one thing where it's like you can't send a form and then just go radio silent until you get it back. I can remember calls with account managers. It's like, oh, what's the status of that account? Oh, we sent, they still haven't filled out the intake form. And you're like, but wait a minute, we sold them like two months ago. But yeah, they still haven't filled it out. And it's like, you're just sitting there waiting for them to fill it out for two months, like red light, red light. <laughs> and it's, and it's, and it's common, right? It's common amongst startup agencies as well, because you're so excited that you got the account. And you're so like focused on getting more accounts that you never thought about the fact that they needed to be communicated with or that they needed to know what you were up to. Um, and so just being intentional about it can make a, make a huge different difference. Absolutely. Yeah. So as you're watching this, what I want to encourage you to do it would be to take out a scratch piece of paper and just kind of like think through what is your welcome process look like today? Like if you're the client, what are they receiving in the mail? What are they receiving in their in mail? What are they receiving on social and have, have you got some gaps, right? Because I think awareness precedes change. And so if you can recognize, well, we can do much better on this onboarding process, you can start to affect a change that will absolutely improve retention rates. And so let's dive into it. I'm going to try and get through this as, as quickly as possible. Obviously, I could go much deeper. But really, as so you think about mapping out that experience, the first seven days, 30 days, 90 days, and kind of what they're receiving from you, what that experience is, what the communication touch points are, um, I'll just kind of give you some cliff notes on how we've structured this. I would encourage you think about like at least your first 12 touch points. You, and in my workbook, I've given you this model that you can kind of fill in. You don't have to use our exact steps here, but I, I think this will help you think through what those steps could be and how you could bridge the gap. Um, so first thing was as soon as they sign up, I want to get a personal thank you into their inbox. And it should feel like a real personalized message from me, the owner. Hey, saw you just came on board, really excited about working with you, right? And if you're the, the owner and salesperson, you can do the same thing. Hey, I was, just, I was just thinking about how grateful I am to have you as a client. I'm excited about working. Some type of personal thank you. That could go via email, could go via social messenger. Don't sleep on, on social messenger, like Facebook messenger, LinkedIn messenger. Um, get the onboard form into their hands. You know, I said, you know, don't drop the onboard form and call it a day, but absolutely have an onboard form so that if they do know some of those key details and they do have the energy to fill it in, they can do some of that work right out of the gates. Um, have a welcome sequence. We have high level software, which gives us the ability to sequence out communication over a week, over a month, over a series of time. And I think most digital marketing agencies have great sequences on the front end, right? To get prospects to raise their hand, to get them to schedule in, to get them to you know, just ultimately sign up and become agency clients. But almost none have a sequence of communication after the client signs up. And so you know, Chase was saying, that's a lot of work to contact the client, to let them know what's going on, to follow up on everything. Think about the logical touch points that you should have in place and map that in advance, create a sequence specifically for once the client comes on board. 
What are your thoughts on that, Chase? Yeah, and you know, pipelines can really help with that, right? So it's yeah. like when I drag somebody to the next stage, that next messaging or whatever kicks off, but you have the contingency of, oh, they're not ready to be moved to that next stage. So that's was going to be my point is like contingency pieces in there because I'm sure, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but onboarding never goes 100% smooth, right? According to plan. Yep. And it, it's, it, there's certain things you can put in a linear track, right? And I'll kind of share some examples of that. But there's other things, like you just said, once this happens, you move it in the pipeline or you have automation that moves it into the pipeline and that triggers the next communication touch point. Really, the goal you're after here is for that client 30 days in, 60 days in, when you see them at a conference or an event, they're telling you, wow, I'm so impressed. Your account manager, your team is so on top of the ball. I've never seen anything like it, right? And that's what you, that's the experience you want to create. And you can be intentional with this. Um, I also wanted to point out, I love if you map the touch points like you're talking about, it gives you an opportunity to recap, like, you know, whatever this touch point is about. Oh, and by the way, you know, so-and-so mentioned, we still don't have your intake form. So don't forget, we're going to need that. ASAP. So like all these touch points give you an opportunity to get the things, you know, to get it back on track. <laughs> yes. hundred, hundred percent. Um, I think you want to have a structured launch call, which is a, like a, a pre thought out. What's that zoom meeting like, or that phone meeting like with the client, they've just signed up for the $2,400 a month program. Um, and you're, you're giving them the, the form to fill in. But how do you reset expectations? How do you resell them on the investment they've just made? How do you set the long-term vision for the relationship together? And at the same time, get the usernames, passwords, and kind of set some landmines. You know, you know that they're going to start to get antsy at about nine months or at about three months in. Like, how do you set those landmines and, and kind of make sure that you've preceded that or kind of dealt with that in advance? Um, and I think having not just a call that's like, okay, hey, what's your username and password for GoDaddy and what's your USP, but a, a structured, scripted, just like you would your sales process conversation can, can be huge. But so that's a touch point, right? You've got, you've got the welcome sequence that goes out, then we wanna have that launch call, ideally in the first couple of days. Um, and then usually about three to five days in, they would get their gift basket, like a, a nice gift basket that shows up in the mail Chase, what do you think? Even if you just did this, right? A personal email right out of the gates, they get an email that's got a video telling them to fill out their onboard form. You've got a, a welcome sequence with a series of emails and SMSs, letting them know what you're up to and kind of what the expectations are. You have a really good, you know, 45 minute to an hour and a half onboard call that really is impressive. And then they receive a gift basket in the mail with like chocolates and goodies, maybe a bottle of wine. Do you feel like the client is going to feel wowed by the experience? Yeah, it's, I mean, I love, you know, you painted a great picture because by the time the gift basket arrives, it's like the cherry on top. It's like, man, these guys just keep getting better and better. You know, things are going well as far as I could expect from a, a marketing company. But now all of a sudden I've got chocolates and wine. <laughs> OK, these guys just went over the top. Yeah. And it's unexpected, right? There's certain things that all of this would be expected when they get something in the mail. That's a thank you. That's unexpected. It comes out of the blue and they, when it's unexpected, it has a different feel. Mm -hmm. And so for us, like, you know, these are all experiential type things we can do in the first week or so. We like to launch the PPC campaign for our clients within uh, like within that first, the first seven to 14 days. Uh, and we can drive traffic straight to a landing page, very easy to iterate, start to drive visitors and leads, right? So that at this point, they should be able to start to see some results. They should start to see not a, a windfall of lead flow, but something tangible where they're like, okay, this was a great experience. And now I'm already starting to see some results from the activity. You could also put right here, database reactivation, right? Get their, their past client database of emails and text messages, uh, cell phone numbers, and send a quick message with an offer to start to get them some amazingly Such quick an wins easy win. in the yeah. first week, right? Such a quick, easy win, totally. And, and now, not only have they had a great experience, but they're starting to see some outcomes, right? And once that, that happens, combination of a great experience with actual results, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. And, and for us, like we usually set our clients up on review tracking so we can show them, hey, here's how many reviews you have. Here's your average review sentiment. 
you know, here's how many reviews your next closest competition has. So you can formulate that, not just into something you run in the background, but a structured conversation. Like, hey, reputation is going to make or break your conversion rates. It's going to make or break how well everything we do for you performs. So if you're in implementing this, um, show them about it, right? Tell them about what's going on. Um, we shoot for like week two, they should get their design comp, right? And, and this is just something that they experience and something that they're excited about. So might as well make, a, make an experience around it. Hey, well, here's the design comp. Here's why we made it this way. Here's where we put the phone number here and all of that other stuff. And it's a tangible win for them in that first couple of, first couple of days on board. Um, have a meeting to review the tools, right? If you've set up high level for them, maybe earlier in this process, you want to show them, here's how it works. Here's how the conversations come in kind of show them those tools and, and the other things that you're implementing for them that they can sink their teeth into. Um, and then for us at like week six is our deadline to get the website launched. And that's in our mind is our, our launch out of the gates for the client. Within the first six weeks, they've got a lot of touch points and a lot of things happening kind of in between all of this. Um, and what I would do is encourage you to map yours and what can you add to that first six weeks to create a good experience and to, and to get some tangible outcomes. Anything you would add here, Chase? I've got one awesome one that I'll throw out there for you guys. You can obviously use a high level uh, workflow automation to send an internal notification to your CEO or whoever you want it to be to open up the conversation in the mobile app, hit the attachment, hit record and record a personalized video note hey, this is so-and-so, the CEO. I'm just so happy to see you guys coming on board. You're in great hands with Bethany, the account manager. She's going to take great care of you. Um, oh, and by the way, you're going to be able to send quick video notes like this as well through our app. So make sure you ask about that on your next call with Bethany. Bloop. And so that, you know, people love that kind of stuff. And then when they find out that they can do it for their clients, it's a double win. Love it. Love that. And it's, you, you can send the can message. You can't, that you can't automate necessarily a video, but that's impressive to the client. And I would encourage you, what I, I've kind of looked at this production style video, like where it's professional and you all dressed up versus you were the CEO, like holding the cell phone and talking to them, almost like it was a personal message. That's going to have a more personal vibe and a personal feel. So that's what I would encourage you to do, like uh, an actual personal message sent straight through the app. Absolutely, yeah. Love it. That's a great, that's a great addition to that, to that workflow. So, you know, just some examples, right? Here's the kind of personal message we will want to have. Hey, I want to send you a quick note. Thank you for your business. Real excited to have you on board. Look forward to working with you. You can incorporate that custom video in a separate SMS message. Love that touch. Um, we set up an onboard form sort of like this. Once they either sign up, you know, and send in the contract, we send them to a page on high level. That's to say, welcome aboard and a video of me and my business partner. Hey, welcome. Here's what you can expect. We're super excited to have you. Here's what we're all about. Next step, fill out this form and we'll schedule your onboard call. So use some video in your process as well. It just impresses the client. It makes it feel like, wow, you've really thought a lot of this experience out. Um, and then have your, have your new client onboarding backed out, right? With a sequence of emails and a sequence of messages that they receive. Um, I could I could go in depth on this, and we actually give this sequence to um, to the seven figure agency members that become part of our coaching and mentorship. That this whole thing, we kind of hand it to you as a snapshot from our high level account. Um, once they fill it in, have a like a really nice calendar page in high level where they can see who their launch coordinator is, who that account manager is. Let them pick the time to schedule the onboarding, um, and then you know think about the onboarding process. Once the credit card is, is submitted per se, you can have a trigger to send the welcome basket. Hey team, go send this welcome basket out to the client, send out the new, new client onboarding, let them know to schedule the call. And then some of the automatic messages you could think through in advance, like expectation setting. Hey, here's what you can expect over the next six to 12 months with us. Um, hey, I want to introduce you to Danya, your account manager. She's awesome. She's been working with us for X amount of years. Um, and then you could, you could really think about what are the questions that you ask every client and what are the things you need the client to do? What's their homework? Um, and this was a big solve for us in our agency. We talked about that whole radio silence issue and like, okay, we're going radio silent on the client and they, they feel like we're not doing anything, but we're doing a ton. Um, we would just send them, hey, part of our due diligence here is we're looking up your competition. Who would you say are your top biggest competitors? 
hey, you know, we want to infuse as much personality and authenticity into your website possible. Could you take a couple of pictures of you in front of your van, you and your team, and send that over to us and just kind of sequence those types of questions out? Um, and they just feel like you're thinking about them a lot, right? Chase, any thoughts on this and like the automation portion of this? I love this. And I would add, uh, you know, I love seeing when people get creative and like I've seen almost adding in micro case studies for each piece. So it's like, if you know you're waiting on um, a web design review or a questionnaire or something, you have a micro case study of like, oh, hey, me, you know, Jane, she, you know, we helped her through that. She had these types of questions at this stage. And, and here's the result of the conversation that we had or whatever, just to keep them excited and engaged about what you need them to get back to you. And so you can automate all of that and it will help people stay on track. I love it. Using the case studies to kind of excite them on why they need to do that and why that's in their own. Yeah, their the own sooner you interest. get the stuff done, the sooner you'll be a case study. You know what I mean? <laughs> love it. Love it, love it, love it. So um, we send this welcome box. I just want to kind of show you this is this is our new client welcome box. It's just a nice professional design box. Nice. It's got a that's bunch like of an Xbox size there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and what's, it, what's interesting is 1500 2500 bucks a month in that in that range it's something nice about getting something physical even though they may not do anything with what that's inside the box receiving a box is fun we, we don't get nearly as much mail as we once did and so this goes a long way in terms of like setting a, a positive expectation right a custom tumbler in there you know, it's a printed flyer. Um, and we, we, we love to send this out. We always get compliments from the clients because they don't see that happen every day. And sure. You know, fun to get something in the, in the mail. And you know what? Psychologically, it'd be interesting to explore this. What you're saying to them is we're so confident that we're going to be engaged in a long-term business relationship. We've invested money to send you this stuff right now. Like we're not worried that you're going to disappear on this next week and we just wasted money on this swag. We know you're not going to disappear. We're an established, reputable business. Yep. So yeah, especially if you set the long-term expectation, you drop this into the mail, you've created a great experience that they weren't expecting. Um, you've tapped into the reciprocity, even though let's say it's 75 to hundred hours worth of a gift that you drop in advance, that absolutely buys you at least your first three to four months. Even if you didn't perform, even if you didn't get things off the ground and didn't have everything dialed in right out of the gates, which you should and you want to do, but this buys you, it buys you a grace period, you know, that, that the experience that you develop on the front end. Yeah. And I feel like if you, if you can get the front end right between your group, the high level community, there are folks that can help you with, fulfill, you know, getting the deliverables. Like yeah. that's almost the easy part. It's this part that's actually pretty hard. And I feel like most people don't put enough time and effort into. Yep. So we got the, the welcome box we want to drop on them. Um, and then you want to structure a, a new client launch call process, which I'm not going to go into tons of depth, but if you can map this out, just like you would your sales process, where you could hand this to an account manager, or you could do it yourself and just know these are the words to say, these are the questions to ask, these are the details to gather, that you're going to make it fun for the client, you're going to plant really important expectations, um, and you're going to create a positive expectation going forward. It's kind of what you want to consistently be able to do um, in your, in the kind of that onboard call. And again, like this is, you know, we've mapped all this app stuff out and we do provide it to our, to our members. Um, so welcome box. We send all kinds of box. We actually have another box that we send once the client goes from launch to their dedicated account manager. Cause that's always kind of a sticky thing. It's like, well, this person launched me and I really liked them. Um, so when they get handed to their, to their account manager, who's going to be managing the relationship, drop something else. Hey, I'm excited about working with you. Here's something custom to us. And uh, welcome basket wise. Like I said, we used the company called Gourmet Gift Baskets. This costs something like $75. And again, it's just another goodie that they get in the mail. So I'm, I'm going along here, Chase. And I apologize. No um, worries. That, that Gourmet Gift Basket looked like a good one. Yeah, yeah, and it's just impressive, right? So action items here on the on the onboarding process, right? You want to dial in the onboarding. You want a multi-step capture process to get the logins and details. You want to flesh out the onboarding script so that you're like really creating an expectation and experience. You want to engineer those quick wins out of the gate. You want to 
you want to start by sending a welcome basket, put them into an onboarding sequence to set expectations and indoctrinate them kind of on the process. Um, and you want to make sure that you're commuting, communicating every step of the way. Um, and so that, that was a lot. That was kind of block one of retention just around um, the, the onboarding process. Chase, I don't know if we have time to dive into effective communication if I hit it really, really quickly. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool, guys. Um, if you're watching this at this point, we're about an hour in. Um, if you're getting value, just kind of drop a comment wherever you're watching this. You know, give me a like, give me a yes, give me a, you know, a takeaway, something that you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. Right? I'm going to start to send a welcome basket. I'm going to start to um, be more intentional with my onboarding. I'm going to map out that first 90 days. What, any takeaways on your end, Chase, so far, just thinking about client experience and, and the first kickoff process in the relationship? No, a lot. I mean, the double gift basket <laughs> is impressive. Um, and I think, yeah, no, there's a lot to take away there. I, I'll have to go rewatch this myself because I think there's a lot to learn. And you're right. When you get it right, it, it does buy you a quarter, three months. It will, you set, you get this right and you've locked them in for at least three months. I promise you. Yes. hundred percent. So, so let's talk, let's talk ongoing communication. So assuming you do what we've talked about so far, you're creating a great experience. Those clients are going to be impressed. They're going to be wowed. But the reality is if you can't continue to show the results and to show the love, what's going to happen, right? They're, they're going to cancel. Cause again, the number one reason clients leave is perceived indifference. It's not about the results. It's not about all of the other things, even those definitely play a factor. So really what we want to do is we have to get them results, yes, but we also have to make them loved, pursued, and cared for. That's really what we're after. So when we think about reporting, and, I, and I, this is all around the, the, the monthly check-ins and the things we actually show to the client, I want you to consciously recognize why did they hire you? What are their desired outcomes? And really, what are they trying to get? And do they really care at all about the technical mumbo jumbo? I'm pausing because I, I, I'm hoping this is, you're thinking yeah, about this, you're recognizing it. When, when we started plumbing and HVAC SEO as, a, as an SEO centric company, and obviously we've expanded over the years to, to do more because we want to have more impact. And we know that that impact makes us more sticky and improves our attention rates. We were very, very heavily focused on technical mumbo jumbo, right? Ranking reports, analytics, um, you know, heat map studies, and all kinds of information that are useful for us as the digital marketer, but not useful for the client, right? What the client cares about is they care about how much did I spend, how many leads did I get, and what's my return on investment, right? At the end of the day, that's what the client cares most about. And as an agency, if you can lead with that and have that the main thing that they see, hey, here's how much you spent, here's how many leads and results that you got, and here's how much money you actually generated, you can separate yourself massively from the pack. You can make it so that the client should never question the, the investment they're making in your service. Um, and you can really maximize your retention rates. Focus on what they care about, not on what you think is important, not on the things that you think are, are mission critical. Um, I'll just kind of show you our reports and we're, we're actually bringing this right into our high level and we're working at this point to also replicate this in high level. But to the extent that you can do this, and this might be hard to see from this distance, like you wanna be able to say, here's how much you spent. In this case, it's a client we work with called Mixco Plumbing, $5,671 for the month. And that's a combination of management fees and paid spend and the whole nine yards. How many leads did you get? 503, right? And that's tracked through your call tracking. That's tracked through your web forms. That's tracked through all of the different lead channels that you might have in place. And then what's your average cost per lead? $11 and 27 cents. And where did the leads come from, right? We got 167 from organic, 100 from PPC, 222 from Google Maps. And that's where the, the breakdown went. Most clients, whether they're using the big companies or the local guy, don't have access to this type of information. And so they feel like they're flying blind and they just have to trust you that what you're doing is working and that you're getting a result. Um, and so, you know, really work on getting your high level pipeline set up, really work on piping in all of your leads, the inbound calls, 
the web forms that are submitted, the web, the, the web chats, drop them onto a pipeline so that you can show them, here's how many leads we generated for you this month and total. Here's what your average cost per lead is. And here's what we're seeing is your return on investment, right? And, and the other example was projected ROI because it's just based on averages. When you get this set up in high level, you can actually show them because they set it to one and, and the value of their jobs, here's your return on investment. Um, to me, this is the future of digital marketing agencies, right? The agencies that can get dialed into that level and show the client, here's how much you spent, here's how much you generated, and here's what we're focused on next is going to win the day. Any, any insights or thoughts on specifically this part of the, of the kind of the reporting and tracking in high level, Chase? No, I think you nailed it. And, uh, you know, we just put out a high level how-to on how to do the automated appointment follow-up survey so that your clients with like two clicks can tell you, you know, did they show up and did they purchase? And if so, how much did they spend? And then high level will do the calculations, right? We'll go all the way back to the ad campaign and we'll tell you. Your cost per lead was this much, your cost per booking was this much, and your cost per sale was this much. And that, like Josh just pointed out, other tools just can't do that, right? They don't see the pipeline. They don't know if a purchase happened or not. They don't know how much was spent. Um, I, I do like your other dashboard, though. It's an interesting idea to be able to incorporate other uh, charges that you're making, right? Like, what if you could go into high level and say, well, you know, I charge them this much retainer on top of their ad free spend. Form field, and, right? Field for, free form field. Here's our management fee. Yeah, yeah, Here's that's interesting. Spend, and you've got an aggregate number. Yeah, that's cool. We'll have to work on that. But totally, I mean, the, the, if you can get it to this point, and, you know, it does take, take some time and some know-how, but, um, you know, hook up with Josh, hook up with our support team, figure it out, because when you can show it, it's a game changer. I mean, they haven't seen it before. Trust me. 100 percent. And it's really that's what they want, right? They want to be confident that they're spending a dollar. They're getting, you know, five or six times in return, right? And if you can show them these metrics, they will have no reason to leave. So what I'm going to suggest is lead with the KPIs, right? Lead with that data. How many leads did you generate? How many jobs did you book? Or how many you know new patients did you bring in? Or how many cases did you close? What's their ROI? And then have the other stuff as a backdrop, right? Yes, you still need to know how they're ranking organically if you're doing SEO. You still need to know what's going on with the analytics. You still need to have the data in Google Ads and the different things that you're running, but don't lead with it, right? Show them the KPIs. That's what most of the clients want to see anyways. If they have deep down questions, they want to get deeper, then have that as your fallback, right? Um, you will lose clients if you lead with the technical mumbo jumbo. If you take an hour to 45 minutes of their time every month, just going over data, they'll be bored, they'll be disengaged, they'll no longer want to attend those meetings. Totally. They'll blow them off. And then yep. by blowing them off, they don't get the important stuff and then they churn. 100%. Yep. And so again, results alone don't ensure retention. Remember, the reason they leave is perceived indifference. Um, you want to make sure that you've got a strategic communication process. Um, and in my mind, if they're paying you more than $1,000 per month, you should shoot to have at least one meeting with them per month, either via the phone, ideally via web meeting, where you're showing them the, the progress. Here's what we did. Here's what we're seeing in the results. Communicate what you're focused on over the next 30 to 90 days. So, hey, here's what we've done. Here's the results. What do you think, client? Are these good jobs? Yes, awesome. Here's what we're going to work on next. And then make sure that you've got a, a fallback. Like Chase said, sometimes they, they're just too busy. I know that a lot of you are thinking, well, I would do that, but they won't show up. That happens to us. We only get about 70% of our clients that will take the monthly review call, even though we've tried really hard through automation and through follow-up to get that going. You can't let that be a reason that you don't engage with that client. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do is, is bake into your process a video recap for the clients that don't meet. You or an account manager or somebody on your team shoots a quick video via Loom or some other platform. Hey, sorry we couldn't meet. I know you're busy. Here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're working on. Here's what's happening next. Um, that is a foolproof communication rhythm that will absolutely make the client feel confident, make them feel loved and pursued, and kind of take perceived indifference off the off the table. Any thoughts on this, Chase? Yeah, no, I like the that you commented there about looms or something. You know, we used to find that to work really well. Of like, hey, here's the things that we know you want to hear about, and here's you know. You're going to get an email after the call with a loom with all the technical stuff. Like if you want to go into that, it's all in there. 
Um, but just spend the actual call focusing on the things that like you're talking about, um, but then back it up. We would back it up with like a video recap of things that, you know, they might blow off or they might not until we got a sense of, you know, were they actually watching them? You know, do we need to continue doing them or not? But it's a good way to not have them sit through an entire lecture that they're not interested if they're, you know, if they're not interested. Absolutely. Train your team. They didn't answer you. That's not an excuse to, to go silent. Right? Oh, I tried to call them three times. They didn't answer. So it's been six months since we, since we spoke. Mm -hmm. Send them a video. Go through the data. Make sure they understand what they're paying for. That takes perceived indifference off the table. And I do think just like, just like your onboarding call, you want to map out what that conversation should sound like, um, especially as you start to grow and scale. Um, train your account managers. Like this is what a monthly review call should look like. This is the agenda. This is what we cover. These are the questions we ask. This is how we see the expectations. Um, doing this can really, really improve your, your client retention rates. Um, so in your workbook there, there, there's some specifics on what you want to do monthly, right? Be strategic with your reporting. Make sure that you're not showing too much, but you're showing the key things they actually want to see. And then really have a dialed in communication rhythm on what that monthly check-in, what that monthly review process looks like. Um, and we'll wrap up here with, with client success management. Um, this only starts to apply in my mind as you grow past like 15 or 20 clients that are paying you on a monthly retainer um, because it starts to get hairy. Landing clients, trying to deliver the results, trying to manage your team, whether that's VAs or whether that's people that happen to work at your office. Um, and then also actually communicate with the client like we're talking about, actually go through those reports and actually keep them engaged. Um, and I'm a big, big believer that you know, you're going to want to hire account managers. You're going to want to put customer success people, or client success people in place. What I found is as the owner, if you're doing all of it yourself, you're going to cap out about 10 to 15 accounts, right? Once you've got 10 or 15 clients that are paying you between a thousand and three thousand dollars per month, you have a choice to make. And the choice is, I'm just going to milk what I've got here and recognize I'm going to be too busy to do anything else because retaining those clients, continuing to do the work and trying to do the retention part of it will, will start to burn you out, right? And so at that point, you have to then hire an account manager, a client success person. Um, and I found that the average client success manager can handle between 25 to 30 accounts. So you want to have an account manager for every 25 or so accounts max. And their main job is to just do the onboarding, make sure that that experience is dialed in the way that it should to handle the monthly review calls and to ensure every client is touched every single month and there to answer the question to kind of be that face to the company, that central point of contact with the clients. And then for every 20 to 25 clients, you're going to want to hire another account manager. This is really important. If you plan to grow and scale your agency, if you don't think about this, if you don't plan for it, you bottleneck, right? You're just going to get stuck. Maybe you can get past 15. Maybe you get to 30 or 40 accounts, um, but something gets, right? Either your ability to continue to sell or your ability to actually deliver good results for the clients or to create a great experience. Um, any thoughts on this, Jason, kind of as you've seen clients and, and, and members trying to retain without hiring? When Josh said this is so important, I, I smiled at because I was exactly what I was going to say. This information that he just gave you is so valuable. I can tell you that when we were building our agency, it took us so long to figure out how many accounts you should expect an account manager to manage, right? Because, you know, our first couple of account managers, I can recall conversations of like, you guys are overloading me. I can't handle more accounts. This is crazy. And it's like, well, is that is that she only has 10 accounts? Is that right? Is that reasonable? Well, Chase, how many accounts did you manage before we had account managers? 50 to 60. Is that reasonable? You know what I mean? And so it was a real struggle to figure out what is reasonable to expect. And so this is, again, the benefits of joining a, a coaching program of hooking up with people that have been there and done it and who can tell you 10 accounts, that's not reasonable. You need to look for a better account manager or you, you gave her how many accounts? Like, no, 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 you guys are not being reasonable as at the management level. You need another account manager. You need to split that up because you know that's not gonna work either. 100%, and, and it could be a function of like, what are you expecting that account manager to do? Like, are, I mean, sometimes if you expect that account manager to build the website, right, the content, 
and of link building do work in addition to managing the accounts, they're going to handle much less than that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being clear, like Chase said on like what the expectations are um, is mission critical. Um, some of the things we really focus on with the seven figure agency members is, you know, how do you structure the compensation for these types of people? How do you hire them? How do you train them? How do you recruit them and get them up to speed? What are the KPIs you want to keep in place? Um, and then, you know, how do you train them up, right? How do you put them in place? And we've, we've got a great account manager advantage training that we built that's in high level that we give to our members so that they can put their account managers through and, and kind of get them maybe from a junior level to a ready to, to really be effective in this type of position. Um, so, and so valuable. And so I talked about, you know, you can't measure what you, you can't improve what you don't measure. Um, this is the, the formula for tracking retention. Um, not super complicated. It looks complicated in this particular formula. I'm not even going to try and read it to you. <laughs> you know, CRR equals whatever. Um, I've got a great sheet that I'll share with you. Um, it's called a sales and retention tracking sheet. Um, something integral to kind of how we operate in our agency and how we track how many clients did we get? What were our goals and targets? How many did we lose? What's our retention rate? Um, and so if you go to sevenfigureagency.com slash tracking, um, it's just a, it's a Google sheet that you can plug in that will really, if you start to track this on a consistent basis, there's a, a principle that absolutely applies. It's what you measure always improves. And so if you start tracking, it's going to get better. You start tracking how many clients you're landing, how much revenue you're getting on a monthly basis, that's going to improve. Um, any thoughts on this, Chase, and kind of the importance of tracking and knowing these metrics? It's just so important. And I feel like so many agencies sort of put it off, um, especially if you're not, like I'm not a spreadsheet type of person. It's so yeah. critical to assign it to somebody who is and make sure that you're doing it. Because man, I mean, th these last couple of slides, I can't tell you, Josh, I'm, and you know, you know, we used to sort of work together um, mm -hmm. and you used to help us out at points um, of how much time and money you waste figuring it out on your own. I mean, we really, what I call scaled sideways for a, a long time because we were just trial and erroring it. And, uh, you know, eventually we got there, but we could have gotten there two years faster easily. Yeah, no, no doubt. So we jump on that sevenfigureagency.com slash tracking. I want to give you guys some KPIs because, you know, like we talked about at the very beginning, you don't know what you're shooting for. You don't know what's good. You don't know what's bad. Um, in these types of agency services, we found that shooting for about a 97% monthly retention rate is, is solid, right? And in some cases you look at that, it's like, man, that's, that's terrible, right? We're losing clients every month when you're at 150 or so clients. Um, but the reality is clients are going to leave, right? No matter how good you are, no matter how well you've got this dialed in, clients get bought, clients have a bad experience. You are going to drop the ball at some level, at some stage in the game. Their cousin starts an internet marketing agency that they want to hop to. They've got somebody in the family that, that is just really compelling that they should move to. Um, so what I found is this is a, a healthy target to shoot for, 97% monthly retention rate. Um, you forgot the, uh, the degenerate son takes over the business. The degenerate <laughs> son takes over the business. And I share this number realistically. Now we work with about 190 agencies across the country. Our, our agency has grown to the Inc. 5,000 list the last four years in a row. We've got over 190 clients. Um, I think we do really good work. Like we're good with SEO. We're good with pay-per-click. We've got an amazing team. Um, and it's, you know, some people think oh, I should be 100%. It should be 99%. The reality is no. don't be depressed if you're at about 97% retention. That's a good, healthy number. That's an incredible number. Josh, yeah. when you compare it to the average, to the industry average, I mean, you know, we saw it around 65% churn across the, uh, across the industry, which is, I mean, think about the difference between those two worlds. <laughs> oh yeah. You have to sell hundreds of clients to, to have 10, right? At the end of, mm -hmm. at the end of any given period of time. Um, now I would say if you're above 95%, you're doing pretty good, right? It's like, okay, we're doing well. We're retaining 95%. We're only losing about 5% any given month. When it starts to get less than that, it's a red flag, right? Something needs to change. You probably want to start paying closer attention either to the promise you're making, the onboard experience, the monthly reporting. Something's not right, quite right. I think less than 
it's massive issues. Time to go back to the drawing board, either in your service offering, in you know, in in, in terms of what's going on in the business. Less than ninety percent, you know, raise the red flag. You know, press pause on client acquisition. Go back to the drawing board. Figure out what's what's going on. Um, would love to hear from you in comments if it's helpful to kind of know these KPIs and you know just to have something to shoot for. Any thoughts on your end here, Chase? I mean, what we love to point out is how what we love to see, we love to hear stories of, hey, you know, I did lose some clients this month, but guess what? They're still paying for high level. Right. So oftentimes you'll lose them for services, but you can retain them on software. And that adds up significantly. You know, a year, you know, 12 months goes by, 15 months goes by and you're like, wow, holy smokes, you know, we lost X amount of, of clients, which Josh is telling you right now, it's natural, like everybody turns clients. But if now all of a sudden you're retaining a percentage of them on just uh, a software licensing fee, a software subscription that's all automated, it doesn't require you know manpower, that's a huge gain for your business. 100 percent. If you can create high level as part of your offer and have it where they're using it on a consistent basis, it becomes an annuity. It becomes mm -hmm. um, a utility that they're going to absolutely continue to pay for. And that probably is the most profitable portion of your business. And so I love the fact that you brought that up. Super, super important. Because even if you're losing 90%, but they're staying around with the high level play, the SaaS, you're making lots of money. You're developing a very profitable asset. Absolutely. Fantastic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit into the client success tracking and then we'll, we'll move on. Chase, are we okay? Like maybe do another 10 minutes? Yeah, let's roll. Let's do it. Okay. I, and guys, if you want more details on some of the higher level stuff I'm going to get into right now, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we can get you, we can hook you up with some additional, you know, deeper dive into this stuff. But five things you want to think about as it re relates to client success management. Um, we have to measure what matters. We want to make sure we get a bird's eye pulse on all of the accounts. We have to make sure we're getting ahead of the issues because what often happens is there are lots of clients. They're paying their monthly fee unless they write an email, unless they send a cancellation notice. It's just kind of flying under the radar. We need to have a system in place where we can see those yellow accounts, those red accounts, those accounts that are maybe a couple weeks away or a couple months away from canceling so we can get ahead of it. Um, and that way we can prioritize the most at need, right? If you do not have a system where you can easily see what's happening in the client base, um, you're going to have clients leave that you could have saved uh, and make sure that you're taking proactive weekly actions. Um, I, I'm not going to go into depth on this, but really if you, you can break it down and really measure what's going on with the engagement, what are some of the warning signs? Maybe if you're doing NPS surveys, which you can set up inside high level, you can know which clients are super happy and happy to refer to you and which ones are, are kind of frustrated. Uh, what I would encourage you to do would be to drop your clients onto a traffic like board system. Um, you could do this in high level. You could do this in Trello. I really love the idea of doing this inside high level as a pipeline. You've got all of your clients. You've got them on a board and you can easily see here's who's happy. Here's who's unhappy. And here's who's red. You can trigger automation, maybe not to the client, but internally to create tasks, to create reminders and make sure that you're following up on a consistent basis. Have you ever seen this done, Chase, where, like, where you would have like all of your accounts on a board like this and easily kind of have oh, yeah. a bird's eye view? It was our most important call, to be honest, as leadership was the red light, green light. Love it. So if you're not doing something like this, which we weren't doing for years, you're going to be missing opportunities to really improve that engagement and that experience with the clients. And so we kind of, we kind of took this full circle here to improve client retention. What we want to do is we want to create a world-class onboarding experience. We want to have the effective communication that hits the key things the client needs. We have to have success management, which is around, you know, who do we hire? When do we hire? How much do we pay? All of that stuff. So I hope this has been useful. I hope all this, this has been valuable. I hope that this improves your attention and your stickiness with your client base. Um, in your sheet that I shared with you guys at the beginning, uh, you've got a complete checklist on kind of what you want to think about onboarding, communication, client success management. If you'd like more help along these lines, this is a big part of what we do here at Seven Figure Agency and our coaching and mentorship program, working with agencies. Um, we've got shortcuts for most of this stuff. 
really to make it easier for you to get your onboarding dialed in, to get those kickoff calls, to get that welcome basket out the door, um, and to really shortcut the process of improving retention. Um, Chase, any questions? I know we took this longer than we were supposed to. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to kind of go deep here. Um, any other questions or thoughts on your end? No, I, I'm glad that we did, Josh. I think there were so many takeaways in here. Um, I think just from this presentation, you could go take Josh's advice and nail an incredible onboarding piece. Um, I think the second piece really illustrates the power of hooking up with a group like Josh's, um, some sort of coaching mentorship from folks who have grown past the level of you know, 15, 20 clients into the hundreds, because those are the folks who have figured out the things that Josh mentioned of how many you know, accounts per account manager you should expect to be realistic, what they should get paid, what their payment structure should look like. Are there bonus structures in there that we need to think about? These types of things only come through experience. And like I said, if you go at it yourself, you're really going to waste a lot of time. <clears throat> and then at the end, you know, things like what to do when things are going well are traps that we fall in, right? Like you mentioned, oh, you know, that account, you know, we got them to the first page. And so do we want to poke that bear? Do we want to reach out to them? Because things are going well and they're paying their bill. You know, that's a trap that you can fall into. And I feel like a great mentor would, would help you through it. I'm like, no, absolutely. You need to check in. It needs to be regimented. Here's what you say when things are just constantly cruising at a pretty good level. You know what I mean? Or here's what you say when, you know, the metrics have dipped a little bit, but not enough that it's a big deal. And you're worried that a big deal is going to be made about it. Like these are all things that you can really lean on folks like Josh's community for answers that will retain clients longer because if you don't do it, I promise you it boils up real fast and you may or may not have a chance to, to save it at the point when it does come to a boil. Awesome. Well, hey man, it's been a pleasure. If you guys watch this and you got value, would love it if you post a comment below. Feel free to reach out to me on, on Facebook or on LinkedIn, connection requests, send me a personal message. Um, if you've got questions or ideas on how to generate better client retention or just how to grow and scale your agency, I uh, would love to connect with you further. Josh, thanks so much for coming on. We're definitely going to have to plan some more for the new year. I feel like we could take pieces of this and break them out into individual conversations as well. Uh, but as always, thanks for coming on and sharing so much value. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching guys. We will see you in the next one.